My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... But I really want to learn. So... Every week on this show, a classical music expert will give me a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the classical classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the classical classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and here with me in the studio once again is the inimitable Amy Bishop. Hello, Amy. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Daisha? I'm good. For those of you who have not heard uh, Amy's previous episode with us, Amy is um, a Houston Public Media announcer and producer, and um, we did an episode once before on tone poems, which if you haven't heard, you should really go listen to. So welcome back to the Classical Classroom. That tone poem episode is a lot of giggling. It, it, it was. Yes. <laughs> it was epic. Yes. <laughs> um, so what are we going to be talking about today? I mean, and, and can it match tone poems? Maybe. March is Women's History Month. And so a while back I thought, wouldn't it be neat if I could do a special on female composers? And uh, so I did, and I thought that would be fun to talk about. In the special that I'm producing for air on Classical 91.7, I feature six of the female composers, the most prominent in the history of music, I guess you could say, or classical music. And today I just thought I would hit on three of them, and we're going to span music from the 12th century all the way up to the 21st century. Nice. So we've got a lot of ground to cover, but that's why I decided to pick three today. Probably a good idea. That That's really exciting because I, you know, I try to have a kind of diverse mix of music on Classical Classroom, but I literally don't think that we have ever had, we've, or featured at least a female composer so that's pretty exciting yeah and 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 the ladies don't get enough props um, <laughs> yeah as far as I'm concerned I agree so. I agree so they're gonna they're gonna get props today nice okay so we're obviously why not do chronological order here sure and we're gonna start with a, a woman whose name was Hildegard von Bingen she was a 12th century German nun mm-hmm. and she was not just a nun but she was a writer and she was a philosopher, and she is recognized as a saint by many parts of the Roman Catholic Church, and she has been regarded as a saint for centuries, so you can call her Saint Hildegard. Uh Um, And the cool thing about her is she was just, she was a Renaissance woman. I mean, she actually wrote texts that were on natural sciences. She was known for her healing powers by using herbs and precious stones. Now, this is a woman who lived until she was 81 years old. Wow, that's really uncommon for that. <laughs> for that time. Day, yeah. yeah, I mean, the the uh, foremost figure of the high Middle Ages, as she's known, oh, she founded two convents. For a woman at that time to live until she was 81 years old is pretty remarkable. Yeah. So some of the music she wrote, and she wrote lots of it, uh, she set to her own poetry. So really, I, yeah. God, what what an amazing lady! I know <laughs> that's yeah. that's kind of cool. It makes you think about like I'm I'm assuming that she probably had that kind of creative freedom because she was a nun and she was sort of not expected to to fall into the social role mm-hmm. that women of her day and age probably had to fall into. It could be. Um, maybe maybe that actually freed her up, even though. To some of us, that sounds like jail. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> nuns out there, I do not think you're in jail. But I'm saying it sounds like a restrictive lifestyle, but maybe like it it freed her up maybe. creatively. So I've got a short piece. It's um, one of her compositions, and it's um, very pretty. I thought we'd take a listen to it right now. Let's.
Okay, so I'm, I'm filled with questions. <laughs> Do you want to know what she's saying? Well, yeah, actually, that wasn't one of my questions, <laughs> but I totally do want to know that. Yes. So, well, I was not a Latin major, but I did um, go to Google Translate. Oh, to <laughs> you went to Google University? <laughs> yes, because <laughs> I did want to find out the English translation of the Latin was. It's uh -huh. beautiful. The, the title is Love Abounds All, and the text is um, goes like this. Love flooded the universe to the depth of the stars, loving and devoted to all, because the king, the highest, gave the kiss of peace. Wow. Yeah. And, and she wrote the, the text to it. And, and tell me again when she was around. She was born in 1098, uh -huh. and she lived until 1179. Okay. That's... My, my questions were kind of about... Um, I was thinking of the, the fact that this music is so stark and bare, and it's just this one, you know, acapella voice. Right, and so, yeah. So she probably was not working with the kind of notation that we know. No, and uh, actually, she was sort of what set her apart at the time from some of the other composers is that her melodies were much more soaring than what was typical for the chant because mm -hmm. usually during this time it was the the you know what we know of as Gregorian chant and uh, so these these melodies were definitely a little more soaring now as far as the notation goes that I'm not sure of but I will say that she sort of created her own she created an alphabet mm -hmm. for herself I wish I could show this picture but um, oh, maybe we can post it on the website yeah that's a good idea it, yeah that's a good idea it said she invented an alternative alphabet the text of her writing and compositions reveal hildegard's use of this form of modified medieval latin encompassing many invented conflated and abridged words why did she do that did it, now is this just to um to help with her music writing this like a was I, she writing in code? From what I understand in my uh, my source here, it said that scholars think that she she used it to increase solidarity among her nuns. I, oh. I don't, I'm not quite sure Ooh. how, but it's okay. because they spoke a secret language <laughs> that only the they only knew. I could think of. Yeah, and nobody could break it. Yeah, that's so unless they had a decoder ring. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, the the other thing that I think is so interesting is that despite the f fact that women, I don't think were seen as fully human at that point in history, <laughs> like she she was able to to do all of these very cool things yeah. and and to write this clearly passionate mm -hmm. music. She wasn't just a composer, but the fact that she she was writing these texts on natural sciences and she was a philosopher. She was a, a Christian mystic. Yeah. Um, and she would she said she would have these visions that she said were sort of like God given. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. So yes, so that's Hildegard von Bingen. She was a twelfth century German nun. Okay. So we're gonna fast forward up to the nineteenth century. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, but it's still a German. And this is a woman who was able to make a name for herself both as a, a distinguished pianist and also as a composer during a time when women were really limited by these prevailing attitudes that making a career out of music was mostly just for men mm -hmm. and and that women you know it was cute if they could sit at a piano and and play something pretty in the in the salon for their guests yeah. but as far as rolling with with the men as far as being there in the the circle of composers it was a little harder i um can i interrupt you for sure. one second I, I was watching this um the series about the history of film and they were talking about how when film began Mm -hmm. that it was very much something that both men and women did. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, they showed a lot of, of examples of really early film work by, by women directors. And it wasn't until 
people began to make money from movies, that it really became a male um, dominated field. Yeah. Which I thought was really fascinating because hmm. women weren't, you know, typically going out and, mm-hmm. and bringing home the bacon, as they say, at that, at that point. Mm-hmm. And so men became, they filled those roles. And I wonder if that's true for music. It, like, could, it you know. could have been. I mean, just the, back in uh, up until like mid 20th century, I think they, they had a totally different social perspective on a woman's role anyway. Yeah. In the time of Clara Schumann, who we're talking about, it just wasn't, I wouldn't say it wasn't considered proper, but it it just wasn't really normal <laughs> they, <laughs> right. for for a female to say, I'm going to devote my life and my career to being a composer. Mm-hmm. Um, what was a little more common was for a female to maybe be uh, like a concert pianist mm-hmm. and travel and give concerts. But even that was a little rare. Mm-hmm. Clara Schumann was the exception. Um, so she was a pianist and a composer. And she was also married to Robert Schumann, okay. who was a very prominent composer during their time. They've got this great love story. I mean, it's one of history's best. They've made movies about it. Catherine Hepburn played Clara Schumann back in a 1947 film called Song of Love. Oh, is that true? Some of it's a little fictionalized whenever you bring Johannes Brahms into the picture, but they, they had this great friendship and Clara and Robert had this amazing creative partnership Mm -hmm. and they encouraged each other and she in a way was sort of well she was his muse and she was sort of the rock Mm -hmm. and one of the reasons was that Robert struggled with serious mental health issues he had attempted suicide he ended up dying in an asylum Oh and, my gosh, I didn't know that. Yeah, but they had this great creative partnership where they were both composers and they would sort of feed off of one another, especially early in their marriage. And wow. he would write stuff inspired by her. She would write stuff inspired by him. They would perform together. So she stood by him and she really championed a lot of his works. And after he died, she pl- mostly played his compositions. Mm -hmm. The music I would sample is the first movement of her piano concerto, which she wrote when she was 14. Uh And it was also with the help of Robert Schumann, who um, helped her orchestrate the piece. So this is written by a 14-year-old girl. Holy When she was about eight years old, she gave this concert performance at someone's house, like they usually did about that time. And Robert Schumann was there, although at the time, he was 17. And he was so impressed with this concert, he went to his mom and said, I don't want to do law anymore, I want to do music. Whoa. Yeah. So So eight-year-old Clara... Inspired, inspired him. Inspired Robert in such was, a way that, that yeah. it changed his life. And he was already, I guess you could say, a, a musician. But this was, yeah, he decided this eight-year-old little girl had inspired him to make his life all about music. That is powerful. Yeah. In some ways, you could say that Clara's father was a little progressive because he was very encouraging early on uh, in giving her a, a, a musical education. So every day for an hour... He would give her a lesson, either in piano or violin or singing or composition. And then that was followed by two hours of practice as well. So she she was a child prodigy anyway. And that's, I guess, one reason that she went on to become such an esteemed pianist. So he ended up signing up for lessons with Clara's dad. And her maiden name was Veek. So he took lessons from Mr. Veek and eventually he ended up taking a room at the Veek household. And he was sort of like this older brother figure for Clara. And there's a story that he used to dress up like a ghost and scare her. (laughs) I guess chase her all around the house. (laughs) So uh, a decade later, they ended up getting married. They fell in love when she grew up and she she became a a young lady. Mm -hmm. And her dad was was a 
against it. He, he didn't like it. And I think one of the reasons was because he knew that Robert had these issues. Oh, and okay. he just, I think that sort of bothered him a little, but Clara was younger and she was in love and they did have this great romance and the, this great chemistry. So, wow, what a story. Okay, but wait, but wait, tell me where Brahms comes into this. I have to know <laughs> about the love triangle. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it wasn't really, I don't know. Some people say it was a love triangle. Uh, others just say it was just this great friendship and they befriended Brahms. I, I don't know the entire story of how they all met, but they were all familiar with each other's music. And the, the three of them just hit it off so well. They were like the three amigos. <laughs> and <laughs> especially after Robert Schumann died, Brahms really was sort of like the shoulder to cry on. But I, I don't think that it, there were any ulterior motives. It was mm. just that they loved each other, I think, as friends, mm -hmm. but it depends on who you ask. Some people think that maybe there's a little something else going on between yeah. Clara and Brahms, and she premiered a lot of his music. She was a big fan of his music. So I don't know. I don't know if there was some sort of uh, love triangle or if yeah. it was just um, a sincere friendship. Well, I imagine Brahms was really busy growing his beard. <laughs> so that he, he probably was you know too busy for Clara but <laughs> no I mean it is it is kind of unfair and and sort of trite to like speculate that just because a man and a woman were friends that there was mm -hmm. something romantic going on there but oh yeah I thought I had heard that that there somewhere. was something well back yeah. then you couldn't even go on a carriage ride on chaperoned without people you know, like raising their eyebrows yeah but and so <laughs> as as like a, a, a contemporary person I feel like kind of Silly that that's the immediate place that my mind goes. <laughs> oh, girl and a guy hanging out, you know, what's up? <laughs> oh, Lord. And this, the keyboard part is so brilliantly written that it's it's just obvious that this keyboard part was written by a real piano virtuoso. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. I can't believe she was 14 when she wrote I know. This. I know. And she also lived a pretty long life, but she just th this life she just had so many trials and hardships. I mean, she lost four of her eight children <gasps> during her lifetime and Whoa. her husband. Um one of those sons in addition to her husband died in an asylum he actually committed suicide in the asylum oh. um she ended up raising some of her grandchildren as a result uh -huh. yeah so it was a it was a long hard life but the cool thing is that she still gave performances up until the age of 71 she died at 76 and then okay. she gave performances up until like five years before she died wow public appearances and usually it was performing her husband's music Wow. I, I love to hear that anybody that age is doing mm -hmm. it, but, but at that time, mm -hmm. for a woman to I know. be doing that, that's yeah. just incredible. And giving live performances and on tour, so traveling from different cities and traveling was not easy yeah. back then. Tell me what the mark of of success was for for composers then like or, or musicians like how did how did they know that they'd made it like now you sell a bunch of records mm. or you know you're, you mm. you make millions touring or you know what have you well what was it for them then as far as success goes they relied a lot on the critics okay a lot and so if you had a a, a bad write-up mm -hmm. then that could really make or break you it, it's still the same now but it was, it was different then because it wasn't like people could go out and buy the CD and decide for themselves whether they thought it was good or bad. So a lot of people relied oh. only on the critics' opinions. Reading in the paper mm -hmm. and, that, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd never thought about that. That's, that's, um, so basically, people relied on the iTunes ratings of <laughs> yes. their day. <laughs> yes, yeah, basically, yeah, like the, Amazon the, the Angie's List or whatever yeah. it's called. And then I guess some of your success could also be marked by which orchestras I performed see. it, which okay. conductors chose to to bring that to their orchestras in the, or their concert halls in the city. So what was the difference? Like you were, you were saying that, that Robert 
was, you know, because he was a man, he was essentially allowed to flourish creatively. He was allowed to, like, he <clears throat> he reached a height of success that Clara, despite her obvious gifts and, and you know, being a child prodigy, wasn't able to. So, so what was, um, how did that look in, in terms of, of, you know, when, when they lived, what did that look like? Um... You mean look as far as what did the what did like, the public how was us? what kind of success was Clara sort of allowed to achieve as opposed to the success that Robert was allowed hmm. to achieve? I think she was respected for being his wife, and I don't want to say she rode on the coattails of mm-hmm. of her husband. I don't know if she would have had the recognition if she were not married to him, and I hate to say that. Because uh-huh. it, it, it's unfair. She had a fantastic career as a pianist. And people knew her already. But I, I think that there was more of a spotlight on her by being married to Robert. And it's yeah. not even because she didn't have the talent. She did. It's just that it was harder for a woman to get, I guess you could say, get their foot in the door. Right, to get, like, discovered mm-hmm. and, and to, to be seen and to be known. Yeah. Huh. What a in some ways fortuitous relationship and in other ways so tragic i know god yeah i mean she and but she was his she was his biggest fan yeah all of the hardships that she endured i want to go read more about this yeah So, so what else you, you got for me? Okay, well, the final person we're going to talk about is someone who is um, present day. She was born in 1962, uh-huh. and she's still alive. And her name is Jennifer Higdon. Oh, and I've heard this name. You, Yeah, sh- she's a pretty popular gal. That's terrible days. that I'm so surprised that I've heard this name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> well, the, I, I hadn't heard of her until, um, I don't know, a couple years or so ago and when I was living in North Texas and she was the composer in residence with the Fort Worth Symphony Orchestra and so her name was just everywhere when I was up there so that's how I found out about her and she's got this piece that I, I it's not her most popular but it's probably on the short list it's it's in the top three so in this case we'll talk a little more about this specific piece because mm-hmm. in a way it's kind of autobiographical okay and um, first, just a, a little background on her. She was um, born in Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn? Where's Brooklyn. That? <laughs> <laughs> the land of Brooks. <laughs> I went. Uh, she was born in Brooklyn, and then she, I think, lived in Atlanta for like 10 years and then moved on to Tennessee at some point. Um, and she currently teaches flute composition at the Curtis Institute. Uh, she was a performance major at Bowling Green State University. Okay. And while she was there, she met a guy named Robert Spano, who is currently the music director of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. Um, they became friends. He has become one of the biggest supporters of her music. In fact, this recording we're listening to is Robert Spano conducting the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. Ah, okay. Nice. So this is a piece that's called Blue Cathedral. Uh-huh. She was commissioned to write a work for the Curtis Institute's 75th anniversary. Uh-huh. And around that time, this was late 90s, uh, in 1998, she had just lost her brother to cancer. Mm-hmm. So she said that she really sort of channeled her grief and her sorrow into this composition. 
Uh, her brother's name was Andrew Blue Higdon, which is where the name Blue Cathedral comes <laughs> from. And he played the clarinet. Higdon was a flutist. So when you hear this solo flute here, it appears first, and it represents her and her brother. Okay. So when you hear the clarinet, it's supposed to be her brother. I see. So he's he's kind of, he's the clarinet, and she's mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. flute. And they sort of continue their dialogue. Yeah. And then at the end of the piece, a, a lot of stuff happens between now and the end of the piece, mm-hmm. but... Uh, Toward the end, it is the flute that drops out, and the clarinet continues in the upward progressing journey. These are in the composer's words. She said, as I was writing this piece, I found I saw the image of clouds and blueness permeating from the outside of a church. I wanted to create the sensation of contemplation and quiet peace at the beginning, moving towards the feeling of celebration and ecstatic expansion of the soul, all the while singing along with that heavenly music. That's lovely. It is sort of, I guess what you could call program music. Mm-hmm. Um, in a way, it sort of tells a story. And like I said, it's, it's sort of is, is autobiographical. That, that, sorry, is that what program music is? It tells a story? Well, program music is a type of art music that tends to render um, a narrative or a story. Okay, so basically like... Like it's not necessarily a tone poem, in that it's um it's not quite as uh, uh, maybe evocative. Yeah, that's as- good word, evocative. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it but it is sort of telling a story. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is telling a story because there is an area that it gets really sort of angry sounding, and in a way, it is sort of like she's going through the stages of grief yeah. in the music. Yeah. Uh, Cause it, it, yeah, it gets really sort of turbulent. There's a quote from her that says, I was kind of ticked off, said Higdon. Part of mourning is anger. It's true, it's very true. So, there we have it. We've got our 12th century nun. We have our 19th century pianist and composer and muse and wife and everything else. And then we have our modern day composer, Jennifer Higdon. It's very cool. I I, I love that the, we got to talk about these ladies. Um, can, you, can you name off quickly a, a few other yeah, lady there, composers? Yeah, there are, um, along with... Hildegard von Bingen um, and Clara Schumann. Then we've got Fanny Mendelssohn, mm-hmm. who is the sister of Felix Mendelssohn. Mm-hmm. And I hate to say that because it's the same way that you say Clara Schumann was Robert Schumann's wife. Yeah. It it instead of saying this composer Clara Schumann, who happened to be married to Robert Schumann, instead, do you, does that make sense? It totally makes sense. It's, it's, it's kind Fanny, of it's Fanny kind Mendelsohn. of like what gives her uh, cred. Yeah. Rather than it, standing on her own work, she's sort of um, kind would, of contextualizing her with by naming the man it, to yes. which she was related. Yeah. yeah. It, I would imagine that um, someone like Julian Lennon or Sean Lennon have had this issue their whole life. Right. Oh, it's yeah. what's his name? John Lennon's son. That yeah. guy. <laughs> so it's the same thing. But Fanny Mendelssohn, she has a great story, too. Um, she And she was actually friends with Clara Schumann because they lived about the same time. Oh, um, Amy Beach, who was American. She came, she was born in the late 19th and she lived until like, or late 19th century and lived until I think 44. Okay. And that woman, there, it was so hard to decide which of these composers I wanted to, to hit on because Amy Beach has a, a really cool story as well. And who else? 
um, a lady named Cécile Chaminade. She was French. Cool name. And yes, so Cécile Chaminade was early 20th century, and I like her story because, uh, again, it was it was one of those cases where her father wasn't fond of her pursuing music, mm-hmm. and it's not like they had to do it on the down low, but they kind of did because it was kind of a secret that she was composing. She was playing music and and that was okay because as a lady, you can play music and and be all dainty, but she was actually taking composition lessons as well. Um, She was born in Paris and she wrote all sorts of of pieces of music and art songs and, and little piano pieces. And then when she came to the U.S. to start her tour, she was greeted so warmly and there were a lot of people who were already familiar with her with her work and were like oh my god we love you so it, it's like the beatles coming to america <laughs> well i think you just touched on something really interesting which is that women are you know huge players in, in as musicians in the world of classical music i mean famous opera singers mm-hmm. you know famous violinists um that for some reason seems to be a tradition that is it's pretty common mm-hmm. yeah but for whatever reason composing mm-hmm. that's not been acceptable what's what's interesting too is that we have looked on the googles to see what female composers are out there and there are tons yeah, of them i know but we we know of so so few of them and it seems to me like maybe the classical music world has a little bit of an issue to sort out <laughs> and that you know like th- there's there's got to be something that can be done mm-hmm. about that and it, like we as a society sort of uh subconsciously just go okay well that makes sense <laughs> you know, for a lady to play a violin that makes sense yeah. but to make music yeah that's crazy talk yeah <laughs> that would be like a lady being on the radio <laughs> Oh my! <laughs> and it, I mean, it, it seems to me like since you've you've talked a little bit more about contemporary composers, you know, maybe maybe things are changing. I think so. I think so. Well, Amy, thank you so much for for bringing this music in today and for teaching us about these awesome ladies. Listeners, if you would like to find out more information about the Classical Classroom, just go to houstonpublicmedia.org backslash classroom, and you can see some information about our show there and see recent episodes. We also have our very own SoundCloud page. It's soundcloud.com backslash classical classroom. Every single one of our episodes is on that page. You can go and uh, listen and comment and all kinds of stuff. Um, If you listen to us on SoundCloud, why don't you follow us? That would be spectacular. If you listen to us on iTunes, rate us, review us. That would be awesome of you. We'd love you forever. If you have a question, a concern, um, just want to chat, send me an email at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. And uh, that about does it for this episode. Um, Thanks to our audio producer, Todd Holslander. Thanks to our program director, Sinjin Flynn, for his spiritual oversight. And thanks to me for saying stuff. Amy, thanks for being (laughs) here today. Oh, it was my pleasure. That's about it for this episode. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time.